The fellow took his dog to the veterinarian and he asked the veterinarian if he would cut off his tail. The veterinarian looked at him and asked him, why would you want to cut off your dog's, dog's tail? And the fellow said, in response, he said, because my mother-in-law is coming this weekend. And he said, I don't want her to think she's welcome. Well, I'd like to suggest to you that mothers-in-law are included in the statement that Jesus made when he said we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. And so that means I'm to love my mother-in-law just as much as my neighbor. Um, and that's the title of my lesson today, loving your neighbor as yourself. That comes out of the passage in Matthew chapter uh, 22, where we read that hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together, and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question, Teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus responded by saying, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he went on to say, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And so we are to love God, according to what Jesus said, and we are to love others. Now, by saying this, this is what, what Jesus ended up doing is he compressed the two into two categories all of the Ten Commandments. He took those Ten Commandments and basically summarized them in two statements. Number one, that we are to love God, and number two, that we are to love others. And you see the cross that is formed. Vertically, my relationship with God goes up. I'm to love Him, and horizontally, I am to love others. And indeed, uh, this is something that the writers of the New Testament, for example, the Apostle Paul, did on more than one occasion. For example, notice what he says in Romans, Paul says in Romans 13, 9. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not cover it. Whatever and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. You see, if I love my neighbor, I won't commit adultery with his wife. If I love my neighbor, I won't murder his uh, children. If I love my neighbor, I won't steal from him. If I love my neighbor, I won't covet what is his. And any other of those laws. Uh, in Galatians chapter 5, Paul says this, the entire law is summed up in a single command, love your neighbor, as yourself. And so this amazing summarization by Jesus of what God expects of us is the basis of James's argument against partiality in the church uh, that we see in our text in James uh, chapter 2 as we're looking at it this morning. Last week we looked at James chapter 2 verses 1 through 5 and there we saw how that uh, he, James was concerned about how the first century church members were treating others, particularly the rich, with preferential treatment. And he used the illustration of a first century church service where people would come into uh, usually meeting in homes and the rich would be given the best seats while the poor would be shunned off to the side or given uh, the uh, lowest uh, spot, the worst chairs in the location uh, in the church building, the, the home that they were meeting in. And, and, and I suggested, I took out of that and applied that to today, and I said that the sin of today's evangelical church may be the preferential treatment that we give to others of friendliness and acceptance. In other words, that when I go to church, my main concern is who are my friends I already have, and I focus in on them, and the newcomers, or somebody else I may not think is uh, like as much, feel left out of that fellowship uh, circle in the church. And, and, and that's the way I applied that last week. Last week we talked about how the James was saying, partiality is a sin. And, and he said that it's discriminating because he says, have you not discriminated among yourselves. You're saying to the rich person, I like you. You're saying to the poor person, well, I don't like you. And then secondly, um, we said it reveals evil motives. It, James says, and you become judges with evil thoughts because you're saying it's out of your mind. Well, the rich guy is better. And you're looking at the poor guy and maybe you're saying something like lazy bum. 
Thirdly, James had said last week, we looked at it, was that it goes contrary to the purpose of God because God has chosen the poor to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he has promised to those who love him. And we looked at these three uh, reasons why we are not to be partial to others. Well, this morning we're going to look at two more reasons why partiality in the church is wrong. And our text is James chapter 2, verses 6 through 13, and I'm going to read it from the New International Version this morning. And James writes this, But you have insulted the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. And if you commit adultery, but uh, do not commit adultery, but if you do murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom, because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Well, this morning I've entitled my, uh, my message, Loving Your Neighbor as Yourself. And as we begin, I would ask you to join me in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the word of God that teaches us how to respond to other people. And we know that the second greatest commandment to love our neighbor as ourself is something that's um, absolutely imperative that we follow. And so oftentimes, I know I've been guilty of not doing that. I have my favorites. I, I'm partial to people. Many times I ignore those that I don't particularly care for and zero in on those whom I want to curry their favor. And I ask for your forgiveness for that in my life. And I just pray that through the word of God today, that you will take this scripture and apply it to our lives and motivate us to be the kind of people that truly do love our neighbors as ourselves. So we just commit this time to you. I take a stand against all the forces of darkness, command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. And Holy Spirit, I welcome you here. Guide and lead us into the truth. For your honor and glory we pray. Amen. James begins by saying it's incongruous to honor the rich. And let's read verses uh, 6 and 7 of James chapter 2, where James puts it this way. Is it not, um, verse uh, 6, uh, sorry, I'll begin at verse 6. But you have insulted the poor. The poor. Is, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? Now, James is saying that while they as Christians were honoring the rich, in reality, it was the rich who were the most aggressive in opposing Christianity. It was the rich that were oppressing Christians and hauling them into court. Um, and that's what he says in the latter part of verse 6. You'll notice as we've just read it, says, um, Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? And uh, we see this uh, characteristically happening uh, many times, even in the New Testament. For example, if you read in the book of Acts chapter 19, there's a major revival breaks out in Ephesus, and many people become believers as a result. And there is a marvelous move of God in the new believers. And one of the things they do is they get a bonfire, and they get rid of all of their uh, uh, um, paraphernalia related to the occult. And we read in Acts chapter 19, many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their deeds, and uh, a number of them the, confessed their evil deeds, and a number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And so you have this move of the Holy Spirit of God amongst these new believers. And they realize, wait a minute, it's a sin to be involved in the occult. And we need to get rid of everything that relates to that. Whether it was their Ouija board or um, their crystals or whatever they were using, their crystal balls, whatever, to 
uh, divine and find out the future. They got rid of that. Notice it says 50,000 drachmas. And I did a bit of a calculation based on minimum wage. Say I'm here in Manitoba, I think it's $12 an hour. That's minimum wage. Based on that, 50,000 drachmas today would be $4.8 million. Well, they made that because that sacrifice, because they believed it was important for them to clean up their act. Well, that uh, step of getting rid of all of this really impacted the community that was making idols and uh, all of this uh, paraphernalia for witchcraft and sorcery. And it led to a guy by the name of Demetrius the silversmith really raising a ruckus. It goes like this in verse 23 of uh, that chapter. About that time, there was a great disturbance about the way and a silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in no little business for the craftsmen. And he called them together, along with the workmen in related trades, and said, Men, you know we receive a good income from this business. You see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. And he says that man-made gods are no gods at all. And there is a danger that not only our trade will lose its good name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, the goddess herself who is worshiped throughout the province of Asia and the world will be robbed of her divine majesty. And when they heard this, they were furious and began shouting, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Back when I was in uh, Turkey and I visited the city of Ephesus, I had the opportunity to purchase a, um, um, image that was of Artemis and notice here the blow up shows that the uh, the bottom of the of the the um, idol was the word name Artemis well that all led to a riot and all the people of Ephesus gathered in this theater this is a picture I took while in Ephesus of that theater where this event happened um, it was able to seat 25,000 people and uh, it says uh, this in, uh, in Acts 19, and as soon as the whole, soon the whole city was in an uproar, and the people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and rushed as one man into the theater. And Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. Now here's a shot of that theater from inside the theater looking down at the stage. And it goes on to say, and the assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another, and most of the people did not even know where they were there. And the Jews pushed Alexander to the front, and some of the crowd shouted instructions to him. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people, but when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours, great as Artemis of the Ephesians. Well, here you have an example of the rich who are taking... Uh, and oppressing Christians, and in this case in Ephesus, because of the success of Christianity. Well, the rich were the ones, James says, who were slandering the noble name of him to whom they as Christians belong. Notice how he says in verse 7, Are they not the ones who are slandering the noble name of him to whom you belong? It's interesting that the name of him to whom you belong is actually later on, um, or earlier on, actually in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, uh, it says the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And that name Christian is a very interesting name. Of course, you recognize the first part is Christ, but the last three letter, uh, I-A-N, uh, in Christian literally means belonging to the party of. So when you said you're a Christian, you belong to the party of Christ and actually it originally started in Ephesus uh, in uh, Antioch uh, where people would use the name Christian in a mocking jesting contemptuous contemptuous way it was like a, a bad nickname given by the enemies of early believers to the Christians themselves and uh, the Christians suffered that kind of opposition and by and so by doing so James is saying the rich were blaspheming that name. And so for that reason, this undue honoring the rich was incongruous. Um, let me give you a modern day example. Ted Turner is the multimillionaire owner of CNN, 
the news net, uh, cable news network as well as of the Atlanta Braves. And uh, Turner is well known for his hostility to Christian and Christian bashing. Uh, recently, he said that Christianity is a religion for losers. He also said Christianity is an eco-unfriendly religion. One time he made this very interesting comment. He said the Ten Commandments are, quote, a little out of date. And he went on to say, if you're only going to have ten rules, I don't know if prohibiting adultery should be one of them. Well, um, that was his position against uh, Christianity, and he he made these comments. Someone had said that after each of these ridiculous comments, he was supposedly have uh, apologized, saying he really didn't believe what he said. But uh, someone put it this way about Turner. Once again, Turner has demonstrated his ignorance and his hostility to the religious beliefs of millions of Christians. Well, for the first century believers to this undue honoring of the rich, James is saying, is incongruous. It would be like today, Christians flattering and cuddling up to Ted Turner. Well, there's another reason why this partiality is wrong, and that's because James says it violates the royal law. And that's what he says in verse 8 of chapter 2. Uh, if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourselves, you are doing Right, and so what James refers to here as the royal law, it's called royal because it's the law of the kingdom of God, and it's been given by the supreme king, God himself. And so God is the one who says to us, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I'll be the first to admit that uh, this is a hard law to obey. I like this cartoon I came across some time ago as the fellow's leaving the church, he says, and obviously the sermon was on love your neighbor. He says to the pastor, I'd like to see you love my neighbor. One fellow put it this way, for me to love the whole world is no chore. My problem's the fellow next door. Eric Hoffer said it's easier to love humanity as a whole than to love one's neighbor. It's so true. It, it really is. Um, Jay Adams, a uh, Christian counselor, tells of a fellow who went to see his pastor and, and he said that he told the pastor that he didn't love his wife anymore and that he planned to divorce her and he just wanted some counsel. And the pastor tried to dissuade him from that and he told him that uh, he was to obey the Bible's command to love his wife. Uh, as the Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And so he said, therefore, it is your Christian duty to go home and start loving your wife. And the fellow said to the uh, counselor, to the pastor, how can I do that? That is precisely the problem. That's why I came to you in the first place. The fact is, I don't love my wife. And that's how, uh, why I want out. Can't you give me any better advice? So the pastor suggested, well, why don't you try a trial separation? Try moving next door for a few weeks and see if that helps. And the fellow said to the pastor, what good will that do? How can living next door help? And the pastor responded, he said, doesn't God command us to love our neighbors? Maybe if you live ne as a next door neighbor to her for a while, you would learn to love her again. Well, the fellow said, how can you argue with a minister like that? Well, some have suggested that this uh, verse, uh, love your neighbor as yourself, really means that we are to love ourselves. Loving your neighbor means loving yourself. Um, uh, someone has this poster, to love your neighbor as yourself, you have to love yourself. Then notice the other one, love God, love people, love yourself. And I want to suggest to you that I'm not sure I totally agree with that. And the, re the reality uh, is that uh, all of us already do love ourselves. As a matter of fact, the big problem we have is not loving ourselves enough, it's loving ourselves too much. That's why Paul writes in 2 Timothy, mark this, he says, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. Instead of having a proper view of themselves, they, they love themselves too much. And so our challenge is to love others as we already do love ourselves. Everybody loves themselves. 
I had some people, someone one time asked me, he said, Pastor Henry, well, what about people who commit suicide? Obviously, they're hating themselves. And my response was this. You know, people who take their lives or even attempt to actually do love themselves probably even more than other people because the, their attempt to commit suicide is, is as a result of their not experiencing what they had hoped for in life. And because of the disappointment of that, they seek to end their lives. And so the reason they do is because they love themselves. As a matter of fact, if they didn't love themselves so much, they wouldn't seek to kill themselves. It wouldn't matter that much. If you didn't love yourself, it didn't, wouldn't matter to you that other people or things didn't work out the way you wanted to do. As one person has put it, suicide is the ultimate act of self-love. If you're considering suicide, I urge you, don't. Your self-love needs to be replaced by the love of God in your heart. I came across this on the internet the other day. Love thy neighbor, thy homeless neighbor, thy Muslim neighbor, thy black neighbor, thy gay neighbor, thy white neighbor, thy Jewish neighbor, thy Christian neighbor, thy atheist neighbor, thy racist neighbor, thy addicted neighbor. And it's true. God expects us to love everybody we are to love all people and as christians that's mandated for us yeah you know, there are some people who and i've had people say but you christians hate gays you don't love them and the answer that i always give to people is that we don't hate gays we love everybody including gays uh, we love sinners we hate their sin in other words we love the thief but we hate the fact that he's stealing um, uh, we love people no matter what, but we hate their sin, and as God does. So James says, if you are fulfilling the royal law, you are doing well. But the implication of his statement is, is that actually they're not fulfilling it, and that's because their partiality to the rich over the poor was an example of not loving your neighbor as yourself. And... Uh, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that when they excluded the poor person who was there, uh, there that uh, in their church service or gave him the poor seat, he was the neighbor that he should they should have shown their love to him. And so, um, by slighting the poor person, uh, they were fa and favoring the rich, they were not loving their neighbor as themselves. And I said last week again, if in church, as I said before. Uh, if you are friendly only to those who are your friends already, then you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. Partiality is not loving your neighbor as yourself, and that is a sin. Now, James goes on to make a uh, statement uh, in, in this regard uh, where he says this, by excluding them, that is the poor, while favoring the others, uh, as uh, James has talked about in the context, we become lawbreakers. And notice how he puts it in verse 9 of our text. He says, uh, but if you show favoritism, you, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. The word that's translated there, lawbreakers, literally is the word transgress. And the word transgress actually is very interesting. The word trans means across and uh, gress means to step. And literally a transgressor is someone who steps over the line. And Daniel uh, 9, uh, Daniel puts it this way, indeed, all of Israel has transgressed. They stepped over the line of God's law. They transgressed your law and turned aside, not obeying your voice. And so when we favor some and reject others, we are transgressors. We are stepping over the line that God has established. And further, um, uh, to be partial is to sin, and to sin in one point of the law makes you a lawbreaker. Now notice how he puts it in, in verse 10 of our text there. It says, for whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking it all. It goes on to say, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Let me ask you a question. How many sins does it take to make a person a sinner? Well, the answer is just one. You only need one sin to make you into a sinner. Um, 
Dr. James Kennedy puts it this way, you don't have to break every law in the book to be a criminal and have the police looking for you. Just one crime is all it takes to have a lot of policemen looking for you. I totally agree. It only takes one nail to make a tire go flat. It only takes one stone to break a window. And so also the sin of partiality when it is committed is enough to make a person a lawbreaker. For example, you don't say to a policeman, why are you chasing me? I, uh, all I did was robbed one bank. I just stole one TV. You don't say that. And uh, it only takes one sin to make you into a sinner. Further, you cannot pick and choose which of God's laws you will keep. Uh, you know, people often try, and try to excuse their failures to observe one part of God's law by pointing to their observance of other parts. Yeah, and they'll say, yeah, uh, I've committed adultery, but at least I've been a good father. And in their minds, they have sort of this scale that they're weighing their good deeds against their bad ones. And... Um, Again, it's like a thief saying to a cop, why are you arresting me for stealing? Don't you know I gave to the Heart Foundation last week? Uh, uh, or the Cancer Society. Don't you know I helped a little old lady across the street? And, 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 and what about all the other banks I didn't rob? You hear about the two sailors who came to church one Sunday morning, they were on shore leave, and they heard the sermon on the Ten Commandments, and the pastor spoke in all Ten Commandments. And uh, said one sailor to the other as they were leaving church after the service, he said, at least I didn't make any graven images this week. Well, the idea of committing one sin is enough to make you a sinner is essentially what God is saying in this passage. You become a sinner if the only thing you do is not love your neighbor as yourself. Actually, there was back in uh, the days of Jesus, there was certain rabbis who said the Sabbath weighs against all precepts and to keep it is to keep the whole law. They actually turned it the other way around. They said you can do everything else, break the law, but as long as you keep the Sabbath. Well, that's not what the Bible is saying at all. And uh, James is going on uh, to say, he takes these two statements. He says, if you do not, uh, if you, uh, the commandment do not murder and then the commandment uh, do not commit adultery. Well, no, I'll read it from the text here. How he says, he says, for he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do commit adult, do not commit adultery, but do commit murder. Um, and so, uh, actually, I have it here the other way around my screen. Uh, you, you, well, no, I do. I have it right. You co you commit murder, but you don't commit adultery. The reality is, you are still guilty. Now, that doesn't mean that one sin is as bad as another, or that it's just as bad to break one as it is to break all. It's not saying that at all. But to violate one commandment is all that's needed to make one into a lawbreaker. The same lawgiver gave both laws. Imagine, if you would, you're making an omelet. And so you have your eggs, your cheese, your ham, your onions, whatever else you like to put into your omelet. And just as you are about to put it on the stove and um, cook it, uh, on the shelf overhead, there is a uh, tin of cocoa powder. And you knock it over and it goes into the mix you have just put into your frying pan. Let me ask you this question. How will that omelet taste? Chocolate omelet? And that's exactly what Jesus is, uh, uh, John, James is saying in this passage, you are guilty of one sin and messes everything up. And then finally, he concludes in verse 12 with this statement. He says, speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You see, we are to relate to others with a conscious awareness that someday we will be judged by a just judge. And here's how that judgment will be determined. The one who has been merciless, James says, will be judged mercilessly, while the one who has been showing mercy will find mercy on the day of judgment. Psalms 18:25. Lord, how merciful you are to those who are merciful. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown 
mercy. Well, I want to challenge you this morning. How much do you love your neighbor? Do you love your neighbor as yourself? And if you don't, it might be a good time this morning just to come to God in prayer and say, Lord, forgive me. I have not loved my neighbor as myself. I have loved myself or I've been very partial. I've picked the people I like to um, love and rejected others. Whatever God is convicting you of, would you just take a moment now to pray about that and, and uh, deal with that sin in your life? Furthermore, if there are some of you who are watching, if you have never taken that step of inviting Christ into your life and making him your personal Lord and Savior, would you do that right now? I would urge you to take that step. Pray a prayer something like this. Dear Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I believe, I, died, I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I now ask you to come into my heart, forgive my sins, and become my Savior. And when you pray that prayer and sincerely mean it, Jesus will come into your heart. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me in the comments below, and I'll gladly uh, help you if I possibly can. Father, use this message. Create a hunger and a desire in our hearts to love our neighbor as ourselves and to be the kind of people we glorify you in every part of our lives. For we ask this in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen. For our benediction, I want to uh, reaffirm the statement that Jesus made in Mark 12. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then Jesus said, and the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. God bless you. Thanks for watching. Have a great day.